This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. Hey guys, it's Tom here and um, just letting you know that Obviously, it's been a tough week for the show and Emerald will be stepping down from serious danger. I was not aware of her violent past and tendencies and her desire to kill every member of the political class. Mm. But that was exposed this week um, and I've just got her on. I've just brought her back for the second episode <laughs> to apologise to Australia. Yeah, to to unreservedly condemn her statements and and her actions. Yeah. Sorry, I don't, I don't have anything funny to say to that, but it was a good bit. <laughs> well, there's nothing funny. It's really well done. About cutting off the heads of political leaders, Emerald. Isn't and that's there? what you did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very quickly, here it is. Feeding the Chooks in the Australian. First bit of press for Serious Danger. Yeah. Serious Danger episode one drops last weekend. Everyone's talking about it. I know. All your cool friends in the playground National and around media. the water cooler. They're saying, like, have you heard, like, is there danger? <laughs> and the coverage that it receives is from the Murdoch-owned Australian getting worried about Greens punk Emerald Moon. It's usually the Greens losing their heads over anything that might cross the ever-advancing line of political correctness. But the Chooks, just, just think <laughs> about referring to yourself as the Chooks. <laughs> I know. And being fine with that and just be like, I'm a journalist holding power to account. But the Chooks reckon we can see some trouble on the way for an emerging star, or should we say a moon on the rise that was in good. the party in Queensland. Too fair, that that's was good. good. My last name is Moon. Um, <laughs> I also love that I'm a rising star as well as a greens punk. Why are you a rising star? Well, that, uh, they say so. The Chooks, the chooks say so. so yes. We should. Take it seriously. Yeah. Political staffer Emerald Moon, her parents were hippies in New South Wales, <laughs> the worst kind, yeah, yeah. does media, communication and community engagement for Greens State MP Michael Berkman and is on the party's campaign committee for the next federal election. I think they've got that form- from, sorry, but I think they've got that from my LinkedIn as well. It's out of date, but, you know. What? That's research. Yeah, that's, that's journalism. That's, that's really there, like Google Emerald Moon. <laughs> a former Greens candidate who ran against federal Liberal MP Andrew Lamy in 2019. She was also moonlighting at the time as the lead singer of the now defunct punk band Class War. Moonlighting. Moon lighting. <laughs> oh, shit. I didn't even get that one. Chooks has been <laughs> sent. Again, Chooks has been sent a copy of the cover of the band's 2019 demo album by Deep Throat by some incredible source, yeah. <laughs> which depicts Moon using a guillotine to lop off the head of someone who looks remarkably like Labor leader Anthony Albanese. Right, right. Already in the basket are the heads of Scott Morrison and possibly Peter Dutton and maybe One Nation's Malcolm Roberts. Moon was a little <laughs> coy when first contacted, initially saying, it could be Scott Morrison, it could be Albanese, before that youthful righteousness kicked in and she confirmed it was the PM and probably Albanese grimacing under the blade although she couldn't be sure because the drawing wasn't good. Okay, I I have to, this is where I have to kind of step in because, first of all, I didn't say the words that they're saying that I've said. He really wanted me to say it was Albanese. But it's in the newspaper. It's in the newspaper. It's in the newspaper. In the newspaper. But what I will not accept is that this drawing is bad because this drawing fucking no. rules and it's really it fucking, fucking good. And my friend Steph <laughs> that drew it is fucking awesome and she deserves credit. It does look like him, Albanese, but it doesn't, yep. she said. It sounds exactly Maybe like also- something I would say. <laughs> Maybe also hedging in case she's involved in preference negotiations with Labor. What? I'm very powerful, Tom. The very party powerful. just sends me out alone. They're like, Emerald, <laughs> can you go do these deals with Labor? We need you. You're rising star, rising moon. <laughs> you're, you're our full moon. Yeah. I got a friend in Canada to do the drawing. I told him I wanted the politicians and, well, suits. And when asked what that meant, you know, wealthy <laughs> this men. This is my favourite this, I'm, Just huge Liberties with that quote as well. Um, people can. Yes, ob- obviously huge liberties with the quote, but also it is true that I was like, there's suits. And the journalist said to me, suits, what, what, what does that mean? <laughs> I said, wealthy <laughs> men, like where, 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 where have you been? Um, and he, his response to that was just so good as well. I said, wealthy men, he goes, oh. <laughs> You have a problem with wealthy men? Mm. He he really poured, like he was peppering me, you know, going so hard at me. That was the one moment where he kind of paused and was like, oh, wealthy men. Fuck. You're blowing my mind, Emerald (laughs) Moon. 
In this era of outrage, it would be easy to condemn the appropriateness of a young green staffer on the public payroll commissioning ugly attacks like this. (laughs) Which I wasn't at the time, for the record, but anyway. Uh, (laughs) Two years ago. (laughs) And so we will. Her side would. (laughs) But in her own defence, Moon says it had nothing to do with the Greens and was, after all, the cover of a punk record. Pretty simple. (laughs) Pretty simple. (laughs) Very good point. Yeah. Well made. Yeah, yeah. So the era of outrage, which is bad, mm. right? And and the, the Australian has regularly said that the cancel, cancel culture, culture political correctness, it's all gone mad. It's bad. Yeah. And we shouldn't engage in that. No. And people shouldn't freak out about the cartoon by, say, someone like Bill Leake or whatever, because it's just drawings. Yeah, doesn't yeah. even matter. Yeah. Who cares? But it is easy to do that. So we're going to do that because the Greens would condemn this behavior. To show how bad it is, we're gonna yes. we're going to do it. But We're it's because that. it's it's because it's bad, and we they might have they they may have right. done it as well. They would have yes, um, and the Greens did would yeah condemn this behaviour well, okay. even though they right now, haven't in any way. It's us doing yeah, it's us doing the, <laughs> yes, but they would as well. Them bad yeah. Anyway, it's a shame to uh, shame to lose your emerald, but thanks uh, thanks for your service. Yeah, yeah, I'll be stepping aside from my position, mm. obviously, and I understand you've got someone in to to replace me. That goes to Bill Lake, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the Greens get way too good a run in the Australian media, way too free a run. They're a bunch of rat bags and a bunch of idiots and I've got no time for them whatsoever. And I'm not suggesting the Greens are terrorists. I'm suggesting they hate our society. Frankly, I've always found the Greens to be a real serious danger to Australia. <laughs> serious danger to Australia. All right, hey everybody, it is Serious Danger, episode two, Back in the Habit. I am Tom Ballard. With me is Emerald Moon. Hello, Emerald. Hi, Tom. She loves violence. <laughs> this is a podcast about our broken political system and its greatest threat, the Greens. This is not official Greens Party no. podcast, FII, full yes. disclaimer. This week on the show, we are going to be running you through all the batshit stuff that went down in the final week of Parliament for 2021. What a beautiful week it was and what a wonderful institution. Mm, bastion of democracy. And we're talking nonviolent direct action for the climate with our guest Max from Blockade Australia. That is going to be awesome. Um, very briefly, though, second episode. Thank you so much to everyone who listened to the first one and all, all the love that's been coming in, Emerald. It's yeah, been great. it's been really lovely. And thank you so much to people who are already supporting the show on Patreon. That is so cool of you. If you uh, can spare three bucks a month, uh, you can go to the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash serious danger AU. That stuff will just go to covering the costs of running the podcast. If you can't do that, that's totally fine. Rate and review the show, share it around, put it on social media. Oh my God. Okay. So, so much to talk about, mm-hmm. really. Lots of shit went down if people were following the news. We had the final week of Parliament sitting, mm-hmm. people leaving Parliament left, right, and center. Shout outs, pour a little bit of a drink out to Greg Hunt, Christian Porter who are leaving um, the parliament. I have to say, I just, you haven't seen this yet, Emerald, but (laughs) this morning (laughs) that we recorded this, Greg Sheridan from The Australian, who's the foreign policy guy, foreign affairs writer or whatever. I'm excited already. The genius who supported the war in Iraq, said that Hillary was going to win the election, said that there was no racism when he went (laughs) to America, so he doesn't know what Black Lives Matter was talking about. Big brain genius. He's written an article. (laughs) Farewelling, Greg, Greg Hunt. And the headline is, my fellow Greg, you leave a big no. hole that's impossible to fill. Fuck <laughs> off. This newspaper, I love The Australian. Like, what a gift. Uh, but, of course, we should never forget um, my favourite Greg Hunt memory, which was apparently his Twitter account was hacked, although the AFP later investigated, found I there was no hacking. about that. But his Twitter account did like a post from the Twitter account BW Cum Pumper 69. And which there is no problem with. That's fine. To be clear. It's fine. However, you were not hacked, mate. You were not hacked. The AFP looked into it and uh, definitely wasn't. So mm. that's very interesting. <laughs> but the main thing we want to talk about is why Why is the ALP, question mark? We expect it from this government. But what we don't expect is that Labor will sign up to a dirty deal to ram through an anti-democratic piece of legislation on the last day of Parliament. <laughs> I mean, we're going to run through them, okay? But it seems to me that the dominating story of this week for the parliamentary activities and the Labor Party generally is uh, just capitulation left, right and centre, giving up mm-hmm. on a whole bunch of policy positions, small target before the election, please. Please elect us. We're, we're a fighting spirit who's on your side, but also we're giving up on just the most basic mm-hmm. of social democratic policies that you'd like to see a, a Labor opposition take on. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, please elect us. Why? Well, why not? But why? 
Okay, the big story that sort of kicked this off was on Wednesday, Labor to dump fuel emissions plan in next step on climate. Labor will dump a contentious plan to set new fuel standards for millions of motorists in a bid to neutralise a growing political attack from Prime Minister Scott Morrison ahead of a bigger fight on climate change. Yeah, that'll do it. They'll stop attacking you now. Surely. The vehicle vehicle emission standard will be formally dropped when Labor leader Albanese signs off on the party's climate policy with shadow ministers as they prepare for a corpus briefing on the coming election. Campaign and and probably by the time this uh, podcast comes out, you'll be hearing about Labor's big launch over this weekend. You know, getting ready for the election and sort of making their pitch to voters. The climate policy, including Labor's target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, is being restricted to a small group of shadow cabinet members. Before climate spokesman Chris Bowen speaks at the National Press Club on Monday, Oosh. and actually, as we were goddamn recording this episode, new emissions target just dropped. Oh, just dropped. Uh, okay, you ready for this, Emerald? You're not. You don't know this number. No. Is that right? Let me put my you... glasses back on. I'm not ready. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Federal Labor is committed to cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 43 percent by 2030 if it wins government at the next election. It is slightly lower than the 45 percent target the party took to the last election, <laughs> but higher than the coalition's long-standing target of 26 to 28 percent. Yeah. So that's the that's Labor's like platform and strategy in a nutshell, right? Worse than worse than before, <laughs> no. slightly better than the libs. I can't do this anymore. Uh, Labor is yet to detail what policies would help it achieve the target. Fantastic. The government has forecast a 35% drop in emissions by that date but will not commit to that target. So the government's saying that, yeah, 26 to 28 is the target. We're going to meet and beat that. It will be 35%. Labor has now apparently settled on 43%. Lean, which is the uh, Labor Environmental Action Network, sort of this you know pro environmental uh, group that's organising within Labor, was shooting between forty five to fifty five percent off the top of my head, and so they went. Anna Band has been out there saying that the science, which yes, sometimes people forget, uh, <laughs> the science has sort of said you need something much more in the order of about seventy cent, seventy percent reduction, seventy five percent, right? Even seventy five, yeah. Like I mean. What I've heard more, more recently is 75% cut by 2030 and aiming for zero emissions by 2035. So this is well below what we need. Well below be what we need. <laughs> and the other thing that I would point out is that this is actually lower than many of the, the targets that we already have in place in states and territories right. across the country, um, including the New South Wales Liberals mm. and Nationals. Um, they have the 50% emissions reduction target by 2030. Um Victoria has 45 to 50%. SA Liberals have 50% by 2030. Um, and, of course, our wonderful faves, the ACT Labor Greens government, have 65 to 75% cut by 2030. So just think about that, right? 2019, you lose the election with a 45% reduction target. Then we have the Black Summer bushfires, okay? Mm-hmm. Then we have a couple more years of climate inaction post-COP26, mm-hmm. more polling illustrating that people want more action than ever before. Yeah. And then the solution is to go to this coming election with a target that is 2% lower than it was a couple of years mm-hmm. ago. So the urgency for climate action has reduced in the eyes of Labor, well, or at Tom, least they think that this will be electorally beneficial. But otherwise, the coalition will be mean to them. <laughs> <laughs> that so, is bad. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, man, I I did a, po- a podcast, my other podcast, like I'm a six year old. Subscribe today. With oh, I don't like to talk about that here, but okay. Fair enough. With James Button, who's a member of an ALP member, part of the left um, uh, left faction of the Victorian ALP. He he wrote those pieces that three part series for Cancel Culture recently in Fairfax Nine. Anyway, we ended up talking about Labor's position of dumping the negative gearing policy, mm. and he sort of said, "Well, you know, it's bad they dumped that, but I understand it because you know the government could." Could would start a, 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 a scare campaign around that policy if Labor goes to the election with it. And it's like you could do that about every single yeah. fucking policy or anything and at all will. that challenges capital or the right because wing. Because they have terrible policy. Like they're a bad – that's right, because their politics are meant to be oppositional to yours. Yes. That's the point. Yes. So they're obviously going to attack them. That's how it works. Defend your fucking policies. And they lie. And, you know, oh, they'll lie. They'll make, they'll make up lies about it. They've got to do that anyway. That's your whole thing yeah. now, apparently, is that Scott 
Warriors of the Liar, he bad man. Yeah. So just find a different way. And if you don't believe, if you seriously don't believe that you can do politics to convince people to cut through the bullshit of a right wing media environment and mm. the attacks from the government, then I don't know. Maybe you shouldn't be. Maybe you shouldn't be the government, really. Mm. Well, maybe you shouldn't be in politics. That seems to be the entire job yeah. of being in politics to me. But what else have we got on the rap sheet? Well, they did a really big fun deal with the Libs this week um, in federal parliament, uh, basically saying that they will support this shit bill, um, the political campaigners bill, that will effectively threaten organisations' charity status um, for even campaigning on issues outside of elections. Um, it, it, it lowers the, the threshold spending cap before they can be considered a, a significant party and they have to disclose their donors and, and basically, you know, fulfill all these other requirements for being a, a political campaigner. Um, it lowers that significantly and it means like all, that organisations like the Australian Conservation Foundation um, or unions and, and other charities will be captured by these laws and just, I mean, maybe coincidentally, a lot of these are the organisations that sometimes say not so nice things about the government mm. um, and actually call out their bullshit and campaign for, for good stuff. Um, but, but what is the, the just to clarify, like what, what what is the what is the onus? I mean, you know, disclosing donors, generally speaking, as a principle, we're on board with. Like that's it's a good thing to have to disclose yeah. donations, right? Because we're we're bad at we don't like shadow or dark money uh, entering our politics as it does all the time, <laughs> yeah. particularly into uh, the liberal labor parties. But what what actually is the is the threat that charities are so worried about with these these kind of laws? Yeah. Well, I think that there is a lot of concern. I mean, I guess I don't like to use the, the term red tape, but that is the term that's been used, that right. it will just be really difficult for them. A lot of these these organisations may not be super heavily resourced, um, but to have to uh, fulfil all of these reporting requirements. But the other big issue is that once they meet this threshold definition, that they could then be considered partisan and they can't be partisan if they want to maintain their charity status. So it, it, what it could effectively act as is a, a spending cap to stop them from running big campaigns on issues if they want to maintain that status. So that's the really big concern. Yeah, particularly when, you know, yeah, if you're part and part, considered partisan if you think, uh, yeah, climate change is important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But the worst part is that they so they did this deal to support that bill in exchange for scrapping the voter ID laws. And absolutely that bill, the voter ID laws were were shit. I'm glad that they're not going to come up before um the next election, but they didn't need to make this deal because as it transpires, the charities bill probably wouldn't have had the numbers. It wouldn't have passed anyway. So it's it's just confounding. No one can understand why Labor has done this deal. Mm. Um, and just apparently just completely rolled over. And similarly, the, the religious discrimination bill, another one where they're saying, well, you know, they're, they're saying we reserve our position until this report comes back. But if the government wanted to push it to a vote, we we wouldn't oppose it, is what they said. Um, and that, that bill has been significantly watered down. Granted, it, you know, it will now include uh, more protections for queer students and, and teachers at religious schools, the Falau clause that that would basically um, have prevented employers from from dismissing someone for being homophobic, et cetera, um, that's gone. But it still includes this statement of belief clause that will override state laws around uh, discrimination. But apparently, even if it wasn't a religious belief, it was just a belief that was honestly held. So <laughs> enshrining in law people's ability to say absolutely cooked things, homophobic things, ableist things, you know, whatever it may be, yeah. uh, Labor has no issue with that. Apparently. The example that I saw Quality Australia using was, you know, a religious person might tell someone with HIV that that's God's punishment for being gay, right? An example yeah. of a sincerely held belief that is informed by religion that mm -hmm. could be sincerely held that you're just copping in the hospital as someone who's HIV positive from, from your sweet little nurse there, which, yeah, it does yeah. seem to be a bit of an issue. Yeah, just something that's absolutely unnecessary to like. There, there is no reason that this bill needs to happen. I mean, there, there are enough protections for for folks um, based on on religion. That this bill is is really it's it's a cultural exercise that has been carried over for for years for by the liberals in in trying to appease News Corp and and all of Falau's kind of backers. So that's what it's what it's about. And to have Labor jumping on that bandwagon 
for no apparent reason. It really is just, just bizarre. It's like they're just afraid to have a position on on anything. Take on any kind of fight. It's like we won that one, you guys. We, we yeah. won marriage equality. <laughs> the, yeah. the country overwhelmingly voted in favour. They were convinced over a long period of time, part, partly due to the efforts of many people within the Labor Party. Full credit. I mean, sure, sometimes people like Penny Wong had to argue against marriage equality in a very bizarre circumstance, but eventually came around. You won that vote overwhelmingly, that cultural moment. Yeah. Yeah, fucking bring the fight up to them. I mean, from the government's point of view, too, I don't like. I don't even know what they want it to be now. They just want it to be to be passed or to to fulfill the election promise, I suppose. Because it seems yeah. to me that the laws as it is, there's no serious constituency no. that of anyone saying that they're protecting religious freedom in any way. But it did allow Morrison to give a speech in the parliament about how council culture is bad and <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, this week Labor also voted with the government to give $50 million in public money for fracking in the NT. Um, there's, there's tax cuts for the rich, there's negative gearing, there's a capital gains tax discount, there's all of these things that they keep folding on. I think we said in the last episode, we're like, we're not just going to be bashing Labor <laughs> on this podcast, but we will be calling out when they do absolutely ridiculous shit. But it's also, it's, it's worth calling out because- from the Greens' perspective, this is the reason that we say that we need to win balance of power in mm. this federal election because if we're not in there to push Labor to to stop being such fucking wet lettuces on this shit, mm. then they're not going to do anything. We, They only, I mean, we see when we're in mi- minority government with Labor, like we were, you know, in 2010 federally, like we have been in the ACT for a long time, we get good shit done. We mm. build, you know, significant public transport infrastructure in the in in the ACT. We put in place the, you know, world leading climate legislation as it was at the time before Abbott tore it down after the the change of government. We got dental into Medicare for kids. We can actually do really good things when we we work with labor and I don't think that there's a contradiction there in in criticizing them for the direction that they're heading now and saying at the same time there is a way though that you know if they were willing to actually work with us if we're in balance of power next election that we could do some really cool things together it's it's so odd to in that i'm trying to get into as, in, a, in, in much a good faith way as I can, seeing stuff from a Labor supporter's point of view. You saw this celebration of Albo this week when he called Peter Dutton a buffhead, right? He said, sit down, buffhead, during Parliament. Went a little viral. They're trying to, you know, key this up as a wonderful moment. The Leader of the Opposition, on a point of order. On, on relevance, Mr Speaker. Well, hang on. I, sit down. I, I'm sit still down. hearing You sit down, buffhead. You sit I'm down. The, I've got the, the call. Of the House of I've got the call. Sit, sit down. Now, you know, sure, I, I'm into it. I don't mind. I, I drop all yeah, the, the bullshit of parliament. Head, sure. that's, that's fine. I don't care. But it's like what that represents is some level of fighting spirit, right? The, the elbow that talks about fighting Tories or what have you. Mm. And if that is what excites you, that's what you care about that is expressed in this, you know, very brief moment of language, why don't you want to marry that to the policies and like yeah. big, bold, fight populist for what policies? what you believe in. Yes, in fight for what you believe in, right? Yeah, I, I mean, these same people will then justify the three-dimensional chess that Labor is playing and say, no, they're voting for this bad stuff now, but once they get in, they'll cancel it all. That's when the revolution begins, when the Labor Party yeah. gets a majority uh, government of its own. Um, yeah, and yeah, Adani was never going to happen because, you know, it wasn't going to go ahead and <laughs> fucking, like, I. that's, yeah, I agree. I mean, I just think... I think that it must honestly be really rough to be a Labor supporter in this moment where you are probably, if you're very involved, like you're giving a lot of time mm. and energy to a party that is letting you down over and over again. I d- and I don't see how that's sustainable for an institution. Like, yeah. I don't know. Trust the strategy. Trust the strategy, Emerald. Okay. But also the thing I love about Elbow is he's trying to go for this Twitter style that you see with like Bernie Sanders and Corbyn oh, too. Well, I can't with, with the fucking tweet. Not like tweet, just simple, definitive, basic statements of principle, you know. But they always have a qualifier. If it was Medicare <laughs> for all from Bernie, then the equivalent for Albanese would be like everyone who lives on the left side of the street and has brown hair should be able to access healthcare that meets their basic needs and no more. Send tweet. Like <laughs> Australians who work full time should be able to afford a house or cover the rent. We need to tackle housing affordability. 20 years ago, the average home cost four times the average salary. Now it's more than seven times. There is a housing affordability crisis in Australia, but it's not on the Morrison government's agenda. A Labor government will put it back on the agenda. 
<laughs> wow, I fucking fell asleep. Like it's as though, yeah, it really does read as though someone has drafted a tweet, a statement that's like a powerful value statement. Yes. And then it's gone through 10 layers of bureaucracy to approve the tweet. And each time they've gone, oh, well, that's, well, we, we don't want to quite, well, I guess, yes, but if they're working full time. Yes, because, sure, know, obviously. Well, obviously, yes. otherwise it's not quite reasonable. They should have a, a roof over their head. And then, yeah, and by the time that it gets sent, it's just this, like, fucking, yeah, puddle of a tweet that just makes me <laughs> deeply sad. 43%. 43%. 43%. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we're going to fight the damning of the Franklin all the way. But in particular, we need to fight now. So today our guest is Max, who is an activist who's been involved with the Blockade Australia movement. Um, Last month, Blockade Australia kind of made a bit of a a breakthrough in in mainstream media and in in the political consciousness in Australia after a sustained mobilisation over 11 days to shut down Newcastle Port. So that's the biggest coal port in the world. Uh, There were 20 actions that resulted in infrastructure being blocked for more than 65 hours. Um, And so we wanted to talk to Max about, you know, what Blockade Australia is all about, why people are... Uh, taking this this kind of action and what they hope to to achieve. So yeah, would you be able to just kind of give us a brief summary of of what Blockade Australia is is trying to do, Max? Ah uh, yeah, so my name's Max. Um, yeah, I, I was at the um, Newcastle mobilisation, um, which is the first mobilisation that Blockade Australia was involved in organising. Um, and yeah, I guess the point of Blockade Australia is an attempt to bring people from across the continent who are kind of fed up and I guess who can see the I would, I would describe as kind of like the fundamental flaws in uh, the Australian political system that are kind of that have led us to a point where like responding appropriately to the climate crisis almost seems impossible. And yeah, I guess so. Like our um, the purpose of Blockade Australia is to try and start to build a resistance movement to Australia as a organised system of exploitation. Um, I guess we're trying to join in the argument that many kind of first First Nations activists have been making for a long time that you know the idea of Australia. It is something that is very new to this continent um, and that it's, you know, it's actually a parasitic organisation. So it's, you know, it was set up here by the largest empire in the world at the time to steal the resources and exploit the population that, that's living here and it really hasn't changed. It's, you know, it's it's got a quote-unquote democratic system that kind of, um, yeah, I guess from my perspective legitimises the the power of the people who are in charge and the climate movement in, in, in particular has shied away from kind of trying to have any larger structural conversations about how how we organise society. I What I found really interesting about Blockade Australia is that it's broader than a lot of, um, you know, a lot of movements like Stop Adani, for example, that might be specifically focusing on um, direct action uh, against a particular project, Um, but it's also narrower than movements like Extinction Rebellion that are theoretically a a more global movement in that it calls out Australia's specific role that is playing in the climate crisis, which is something that our country tries to obscure. It tries to lay blame on poorer countries for the climate crisis. So actually highlighting the problem of Australia's contribution, I think, is really valuable. And, and just for listeners' sake, um, Max, can you just paint a picture for us for people who didn't see all the, the footage? What kind of actions are we talking about? What is the kind of direct action that you're involved in personally and your comrades in Blockade Australia were involved in to actually fuck up the process of coal production around around Newcastle and these kind of actions? Uh, the Hunter Valley is, yeah, one of the largest coal supply chains in the world. It's probably something that a lot of people living on this continent haven't really heard of, but yeah, so the other uh, infrastructure there, it's uh, basically got one railway line that runs for 30 kilometres from out in the valley where yeah. all the mines are into the coal port. We chose to target this, I guess, for lots of reasons. Um, but what we're trying to focus on at Blockade Australia is that this continent has like a pretty long and proud history of direct action. Mm-hmm. But I guess like it's generally been used in a setting where like we're trying to defend against the, the colony as it kind of expands out on the frontier and I guess that's kind of always given us kind of a tactical disadvantage you know you'll be at a blockade somewhere and the police get to choose the time you know when they come and raid and that's generally when the camp is low and yeah I guess like we yes I guess with this project I guess we're trying to um, get a bit proactive about the way that we uh, try and defend the planet from Australia 
our aim is to go out and target the most important organs of the Australian organisation and, um, yeah, I guess use, you know, some pretty effective tactics to, to shut it down. I did 11 days of direct action at the port. Yeah, so use lots of different sorts of blockading devices. A uh, car was driven onto the railway line and someone locked their arm in, into a hole in the ground uh, and that kind of stopped trains for four or five hours. Um, we had people who were climbing up tripods. Uh, the aim of the tactic is to make the um, other operation of the supply chain pretty impossible unless they yeah, are going to run someone over. Yeah. Our aim with this mobilisation was to try and talk to the portion of the population that can kind of see the writing on the wall, that there's been warnings about the climate crisis for decades. And I guess the, the stock standard Australian position in response to that is to like go ahead and actively block action on the crisis. And that's happening like domestically here and with us lobbying efforts yeah. all over the world. So yeah, I guess... We are asking the population that's living here on this continent to start to view not just the government but also the institutions and the corporations behind the government as a barrier to change mm. and that something that needs to be overcome. And, yeah, I guess like our ambitions with this project is to try and get large numbers of people to be participating in um, extended periods of shutdown of vital parts of the economy and and I guess like our aim is to try and make it politically impossible for Australia to continue the way that it is at the moment. Yeah. But yeah, I guess like we're definitely, you know, choosing a fairly blunt instrument um, with direct action but yeah, I guess our kind of analysis on the way change has been made historically is that like when you're faced with kind of an authoritarian Mm -hmm. regime, um, which I believe Australia is, you know, we do really need to look at what forms of political action are actually effective in those situations. And in my mind, the bare minimum of that is kind of organised direct action and, and then there's a whole kind of um, array of options that fall under that. But, yeah, I guess that's that's the, the difficult conversation mm-hmm. we're trying to have with um, people who are climate concerned is that, like, the um, pathways for change that you've been told throughout your life kind of exist and, and are there to serve you, that they're actually there to stop you from having a meaningful impact. Yeah, it reminds me, I mean, in Scott Ludlam's book, he refers to elections as something like a a pressure valve where it's to kind of allow the populace who might be concerned about something like climate change to kind of blow off steam without actually really building up enough pressure to really disrupt the system and and make the the kind of change that's needed. And I know I saw in one of the the actions that Blockade Australia did I think someone was was locked on or they were holding a banner that said something like you'll die waiting for a climate election. So I guess the question that that I have for you know I think the movement um, and the Greens support uh, have been supporting you know the Blockade Australia actions and 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 nonviolent direct action for a long time. We have a long history of that, but. How can we have kind of those complementary parts of, you know, we have people that are engaged in electoralism, but we also have people engaged in nonviolent direct action. We have people that are engaged in, you know, more traditional kind of tr- protest tactics like um, blocking streets or, or rallies. Like how can we all work together to make this happen? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, in my mind, it's just about like using all the time we have available mm-hmm. to us. And, you know, I mean, on this continent, we have like one federal election every three and a half years and there's a lot of time when that's not happening and we believe that the focus of people who are climate concerned, we're asking people to take it more seriously as well. Like we're not going to be able to force this kind of 250-year-old colonial project to change its patterns of behaviour by um, asking the people who represent it nicely to change. Yeah, like exactly. we need to learn how to be powerful mm. um, and that's not something that I believe has ha- has happened on this continent for better part of a decade, you know, like powerful, organised, direct action. You know, I've been a member of the Greens myself in the past and I think the role of the Greens in this sort of situation is to um, back the people who are taking mm. direct action yeah. and be as brave as they can in, in terms of encouraging people to, yeah, I guess to not fall into that trap of being like, oh, the election's next yeah. year, we we'll can just sit back then. and like relax. It'll, 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 you know, next time it'll be a climate yeah. election. Someone will come and save us, you know, the politicians will save us. Yeah. Totally, totally. Yeah. We'll get labour in, you know, like that. And, yeah. Yes. 
I think we saw the limits of that in response to the arrest that came out of the blockade action. This is why it sort of hit the news last week. One activist in particular from Blockade Australia, Sergio, is 22 years old, was, jumped on top of a, a coal train um, to slow the production, I think glued his hand to, to one of the carriages as well, was eventually removed and arrested, received a 12-month sentence, prison sentence, with six months yeah. no parole period, like, yeah. like locked in. Um, he, that's since been appealed and he's been granted bail while that appeal goes through, which yeah. I think is good news. That is a horrific sentence that's crazy. You had the um, obviously the uh, Liberal state government in New South Wales saying that this was absolutely appropriate. They're all ratbags and throw the book at them and they were endangering lives and all this bullshit. The federal shadow minister uh, assisting for climate change and Shortland MP Pat Conroy said that he thought this sentence was entirely appropriate. I support strong action on climate change. But what this particular individual has pursued with his cohort is to divide our community. It's entirely counterproductive and all this bullshit and nonsense. And Adam Bant, leader of the Greens, did say, posted this, that news story and said, the real criminals yeah. are the big coal and gas corporations that are burning our future for corporate pro- profits and the politicians that enable them. Mm. And Which, again, is a good redirect, right? Like, what the fuck are you talking about? You're sending a 22-year-old to prison for a year for standing up for the thing that we all agree, in theory, is happening, the planet burning, uh, which is the re- direct result yeah. of the profit-seeking companies. Like, surely those climate criminals should be occupying far more of our time and concern than the actions of some some protesters who are actually turning our concern into some fucking action. Yeah, you know? yeah, totally. I know that this isn't that's that that kind of mobilisation in Newcastle Port was really only a start for Blockade Australia and you have big things planned. Um, they're still yeah. coming up next year, 2022. How can people get involved if, if they do want to kind of step up their efforts for climate action? Uh, yeah, so I guess like in terms of people getting involved, like the mobilisation that we have planned in Sydney next year, like we're obviously going after a much larger target and something that is like, I guess, more controversial, you know, like it's not coal, it's not something that people already have like a familiarity mm-hmm. with like coal being bad for for climate um our aim with that is to try and pivot the conversation kind of away from the idea of there being like bad industries or like little bits of kind of the australian system that we can just change and it will be all right we want to shift the focus onto like the places where the people who hold the most power kind of live and operate yeah and we think sydney which was kind of the original place where this project started um the largest city it's where the opposition leader and the prime minister both live I guess in our mind, that's the that's the centre of political power on this continent. And when we're faced with a system that is at at, at the moment has so few um, mechanisms for accountability, mm. I guess the mobilisation next year is like aimed at trying to get all of us to learn how to organise in really yeah. large numbers against, I suppose, the against the supply chains that you know keep the machine moving forward. And yeah, yeah, I guess that's that's. I guess what we're asking people to do is to keep organising in their local communities. I was just the things that are happening there on the ground, um, but at the same time, start building things, start making plans to come down to Sydney, I guess what we consider the most critical part. Mm. Um, and I guess, yeah, where 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 kind of the uh, cancer started, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so that's in Sydney from the 27th of June to the 2nd of July yeah. um, is that really big action. And I know that you've got a bunch of sort of opportunities for people to learn more about um, how to get involved with this kind of thing and to, yeah, start getting prepared for that. You've got a, a public telegram channel, Blockade Australia, you're running info nights. Um, and where can people find Blockade Australia on social media? Ah uh, yeah, so we've got um, platforms on Facebook, on in, in yeah. Instagram. Kind of got a bit of a defunct TikTok, <laughs> not going that well. Um, but yeah, and yeah, we've also got a website as well, which which has a lot of our information on it. So the the website, if folks are interested in more information, is blockadeaustralia.com. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to to touch on before we? Wrap up, Max. Oh, I guess just like yeah, I wanted to reiterate the urgency of the crisis that we are facing, and that like encourage people not to be lulled into passive position. When yeah, I guess in terms of the way they're responding to the crisis, like we showed with the new customer mobilisation, that a very small group of people taking organised action can have a huge impact. We think that uh, the climate crisis is yeah you know, the biggest unionising opportunity that. Mm people on this continent have 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 had for a very long time and that people need to stand up and 
take it upon themselves to resist what is happening to their world and would also encourage people to think about the consequences of them not acting mm. and mm. us collectively allowing the ruling class to keep destroying the planet. Fucking well said, man. Solidarity to you. Thank you for your work. I appreciate it. I have nothing but respect for your bravery. I'm a coward and, <laughs> and I'm scared of heights. So uh, you wouldn't say me out there necessarily, but I will be <laughs> side by side supporting you. Thanks for talking to us on Serious Danger, Max. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much, Max. Solidarity. Thank you both. The Australian government has shown that they are either not capable or not willing to take the action needed to stop climate disaster. I kind of started following the the Blockade Australia stuff. I started noticing a few things popping up on social media about the actions they were taking and I was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, And then when I saw the news that Sergio had been sentenced to, you know, the the 12 12 months in prison, it's going to make me sound like a big baby, but I was out at dinner with my friends and I started crying. It's just so depressing and just makes you so angry that, you know, governments are willing to go to such lengths, you know, government and and courts, I guess the broader state apparatus to silence this kind of protest because they know that it's effective. Yeah. I saw an estimate that those Newcastle actions cost something like $60 million for the industry, like somewhere in that kind of um, area, which is a fucking cool, but yeah, pretty, pretty cool. And you understand why that yeah. gets this kind of response, this very hate, mm-hmm. very strong state repression of these kind of actions. And yeah. And immediately the debate goes to, oh, these protesters, they're putting people in danger. Hindering mining equipment is a charge, <laughs> apparently. That's like an actual yeah. law. Yeah, yeah putting people in danger. Like, I mean, not to state the obvious. <laughs> We're recording on Friday and just yesterday there was a, a rally in inner city Brisbane um, to sort of protest, you know, Sergio's sentence, but also the broader quote unquote crackdown on on climate activism. And uh, this was in the same, I think in the same week potentially that that sentence was, was handed down. There was this report that was released by a, a few NGOs. It was the Human Rights Law Centre. Greenpeace Australia Pacific and the Environmental Defenders Office. And the report was called Global Warning, the Threat to Climate Defenders in Australia. So I'll read a just a quick quote from The Guardian. There was a little bit of reporting on it. The report talks about how pressure from business interests, legal changes and policing tactics have converged to create an environment of repression for those protesting inaction on the climate crisis. These organisations say that the introduction of harsh anti-protest laws around the country, the use of heavy-handed bail conditions normally reserved for organised crime, and excessive penalties given to those who commit minor offences while protesting indicate a worrying trend. General Counsel at Greenpeace Australia Pacific, Katrina Bullock, said the trend had been building over the previous five years but is now reaching fever pitch. Mm. And, I mean, clearly, clearly it absolutely is. They're fucking terrified and they're locking up young people for, for six months to or, or longer. To well, longer, we should happening. say, like, the New South Wales Police Commissioner, Mick Fuller, has threatened <sighs> to charge climate protesters who block rail lines with laws intended to punish those who injure or kill rail passengers and those charges mm. carry a maximum sentence of 25 years in jail. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the idea that that climate protesters are effectively akin to to, ter- to terrorists. Yeah. Like this, this language has been kind of bandied around the political um, landscape, particularly in in this country, for for some years now. Um, but it's obviously having real world co- consequences. And this is what th- this report, um, Global Warning, it, it talks about a few key kind of issues. It talks about first of all the massive political power and influence of fossil fuel corporations and how that is suppressing Mm. climate action. It talks about the huge amounts of money that we know flow from from coal and and gas and oil corporations into both major parties. Uh, I mean, given that probably most people tuning into this podcast already know, but it's worth reiterating that the Greens are still the only party that doesn't take money from these companies and fucking surprise, surprise, we're the only party that's willing to actually like disrupt their business model or to, you know, to challenge them when it comes to to um, climate action. So not a coincidence. No. But, yeah, they, they talk about potentially putting in spending caps and, and political donation caps. Um, and even when we talk about banning corporate political donations, which is Green's policy, I do wonder, though, whether these companies now just hold such kind of 
ideological and symbolic political power by virtue of the like stupid culture war around <laughs> climate change that even if you took the money out now they're just so they they firmly have that seat at the table like mm. I, I don't know they can still offer jobs i suppose to people who leave politics yeah. and go straight in there like ben wyatt and wa labor <laughs> treasurer leaves parliament three months later as a non-executive director at woodside energy and that kind of shit yeah. but but this kind of like um you know repression of monitoring of um, suppression of protests. I mean, it's a tale as old as time. As long as people have been mm-hmm. protesting and trying to disrupt the power of people with power and capital, you've had this shit going on. I mean, part of this report about the um, the crackdown on climate protesters came with this story, this insane story out of Victoria about Sarah Rees, who's a yeah. conservationist who's been you know organising protests to try and stop a bit of logging. And she found out that a private investigator had been hired by Vic Forrest's which is a government agency, right, owned and run by the- Very normal. <laughs> cool government, cool normal government. Normal government. Stuff. Victorian state government hires a private investigator to follow her for four days to dig up any dirt, right? And and they're really explicit. The, yeah. the private, the PI is going the record saying, they said, get dirt on this lady. I want to know where she's going. I wanted to have all this shit on her to obviously yeah. discredit her because the protests were clearly working or making an impact and garnering a lot of community support against a whole bunch of logging projects. And this, have you ever heard of the spy cop scandal in the UK? No. Oh my God. Fucking bonkers. <laughs> so this is like undercover cops infiltrating environmentalists and unionists mm. to the point where they would be there for years, form romantic relationships with oh, people. Yeah. Classic. Classic style, yeah. And, you know, and lots of people, you know, pursued this through the courts and charged these people with rape because they were, you know, having sex under false pretenses. Yeah, they were in p- part of a leftist movement trying to get a bit of justice in the fucking world and the person they're, like, married to has a secret yeah. family somewhere else on the other side of the country and is an undercover it cop. It could be me. It could be you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to bring out the greens I'm, with all I'm, your cartoons of loving off the heads. That's right. Yeah, it's all part of my plan, my my good plan. I yeah, like I I think a lot of the time it's easy to make fun of people who are really involved in in activism and in these spaces for being like hyper cautious and and paranoid right. and you know everyone has to talk on encrypted messaging apps and and all that sort of thing. But like apparently they have good reason to because the state literally is trying to fucking follow and surveil them. Yes. But also, uh, you know, the, the stories of these protests is often dismissed or they talk about, oh, they've got a record of protests, the professional protesters or, or what have you. But one protester in Blockade, I think she she um, hung herself on, on a rope to – sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> she did not do that. She strung herself up in order to disrupt coal production. She's fine. But she said uh, – she, she told a media outlet she was involved in climate activism since, since she was 16 but was pushed to do more after her property was burnt during the Black Summer bushfires, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, a whole bunch of young people involved in Blockade Australia who were just saying, well – how are we supposed to trust the system? Like this, this idea that we should yeah. not take those kind of exte- steps that Max was talking about, taking direct action, actually fucking up the system. What, what are you supposed to do? Yeah, vote for one of the two major parties who both accept these corporate donations and haven't done anything in the decades of climate inaction that we've experienced. You know, go to a protest, which I, mm. protests aren't bad. No. But there's a great David Graeber quote that says, you know, a, a protest is asking the powers that be to dig a well. Direct action is digging the well and daring them to try and stop you, right? I- yeah, yeah. I think like, and and this is the thing that's there's acceptable and there's unacceptable protest mm. to to these people, um, and that's why that's what they talk about a lot of the time. This this report that I mentioned um, goes into all of the the range of anti protest laws that have been introduced in the last few years across the country. And a lot of the time, when governments are introducing those laws, they justify them by saying, "Oh, you know, I have no problem with with reasonable political, you know, uh, lawful police protest. approved scheduled yeah, protest." That's right. It's scheduled and they've got a permit and they can walk on the street. Look, I have no problem with that. Of course you don't because it's probably not going to actually change anything. Right. Um, but, yeah, the report talks about in Queensland there were the lock-on um, device laws introduced just a, maybe a couple of years ago. Greens were the only – the one Greens MP was the only MP to oppose that in, in Parliament at the time. Um, the, the Tasmanian protection from protesters laws. Um, and then this week – I, I saw after activists had had locked onto Adani's rail line to block the the first load of coal going out. Adani was calling on the the Queensland government to introduce even tougher penalties because apparently they're not tough enough. Mm. Um, 
it's yeah, like I, I don't know what more they they want them to do. Clearly, it's yeah, it's to to paint these these protesters as on on the same level as as violent terrorists. Effectively, that's that's the kind of legal qualification that they want. Mm. It seems. What about counterpoint? Devil's advocate, um, you know, what about the what some would argue is an alienation effect or when this kind of stuff mm. does go wrong? And I think there are legitimate critiques of some of the tactics employed by, say, Extinction Rebellion when we yeah. saw, you know, them in particularly in the UK, there were those protests where they were stopping people getting on the tube, like they were on top of the tube yeah. and you would kind of go, this doesn't feel like the right target. This does feel like it's just fucking up working people's day. And yeah. when they do other protests, Extinction Rebellion and others, when it's far more targeted, uh, I think when they, you know, blockaded a private airport where a whole bunch of private jets um, fly in and out of, you're mm. like, boom, absolutely. When you're targeting these actual oil companies as Blockade yeah, Australia was, the target. when the yeah. target's there, is it sort of makes sense. But do you think there's anything to that idea that, I don't know, middle mainstream Australia, whoever the fuck that is, reacts badly to this stuff or, or maintains the Greens in the category in the eyes of some as a, as a party of protest? Oh, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I would love to get, so John O'Shree, who's the, um, some may know him as Rainbow Scarf Man, but the <laughs> Greens councillor <laughs> here in Brisbane who is very outspoken, probably I would say one of, if not the f- most famous um councillor in the country, um, just local government, but he has done a fair bit of writing about, yeah, the merits of um, particularly protests that block streets and that inconvenience ordinary people and the and the efficacy of that. And he made a, a post um, when the Blockade Australia stuff started kicking off, and I'm quoting, it's interesting that despite being quite sensational and highly disruptive, the, these protests attracted nowhere near as much media coverage as climate protests that block inner city streets. Um, mm. And... I think it's true. Like I, I, I think eventually people started paying attention. People, especially, started paying attention after this sentence for for Sergio. But actually, initially, it really it it got almost no media coverage, despite being really significant. Um, and Jono points out, like there are a few reasons for that. That activists, first of all, they can't tip journalists off in advance before they conduct these kind of actions. A lot of the time, the 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 locations are less accessible for for camera crews. It, what Jono says is, you know, while these kinds of protests are obviously effective at directly disrupting multinational coal companies, because they don't just dis- necessarily disrupt the public at large, they perhaps don't generate quite the same level of broader public debate and thus pressure on the political establishment. I don't know. I don't know if I agree with Like I, I struggle because, yeah, I, I think that if we're targeting um, coal corporations or who are targeting politicians and we should have actions that target them. But there is a lot of, of evidence to indicate as well that political change is is one, I guess, by a combination of that and broader public actions that are designed to make this part of the, the public discussion and that that necessarily may involve inconveniencing people. And actually a lot of the time, even though News Corp and, and whoever else will pick out a few people who are really pissed off um, that they got caught up in traffic or, you know, it really inconvenienced them that day. Actually, when you talk to a lot of people who may have been a little late to work that day, they'll say, yeah, it was kind of inconvenient, but I understand that people care about this and it's important, mm. you know. Um, I don't think that it, it creates the kind of backlash that people say. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. Mm. And also, I mean, public. there's always been public backlash to <laughs> – any demands yeah. for change and social justice. People hated Martin Luther King at the time. All this yeah. stuff gets rewritten in, in in retrospect too, by the way. So, like, you know, all these conservatives yeah. today say, oh, yes, that was a wonderful liberal cause that I totally would have supported if I was around in the 50s and 60s. You know, yeah, would you? Or, you yeah. know, Bob Brown did the right thing when he did the Franklin Dam. That was a good protest. That was a sensible one. That yeah, made that's, sense. that's okay. Yeah, it's just like, I no, it's- people fucking despised them at the time. Yeah, they really did. And it takes years and years for people to see how they're on the right side of history. Well, we'll keep you updated. I mean, obviously, Sergio's case has got to go through this appeal. I assume that you'll need like bail funds or sort of crowdfunding to cover legal expenses for a lot of these people. It was also hit by a $200 fine, which just seemed petty to me. It's like, just come on. <laughs> if you send him to jail for 12 months, for fuck's sake, don't worry about the 200 bucks. But yeah. All right. Watch this space, friends. Read between the lines. They really hate motorists and they want to punish them. Socialism, they dabble with socialism. And I think we'll see more of that in the lead up to the next election. Lights, camera, call to action. (laughs) 
Awful. I didn't realise that was coming. Go on. What should people do to make the world a better place? Uh, they could, if you want to buy people Christmas gifts, if that's the thing that you do, you could buy some Greens merch. Check out your local campaign, see if they have merch. A couple of the local Greens campaigns in Brisbane have had some really cool merch, which is where I got this idea. But if you had to shop.greens.org.au, they have some stuff on there. And they also, hot tip, go to the vintage page and they have like a random collection. It's not really vintage. It's just kind of a random collection of other merch, including Green's earrings, which I love. Ooh. So, yeah, grab some for yourself or some for your loved What ones. else you got in there? You Don't you have like beach, be nice. you got like bucket hats and stuff, Real some real Queensland shit? Yeah, well, shit. that's the Griffith campaign. Oh, right, cool. Yeah, the Griffith campaign has the most most <laughs> Queensland Green's merch ever. Bucket hats, stubby cooler, tote bag. And and shirts that's about a four day working week and and three days for the beach. Good shit. Beach socialism, baby. Love it. Um, yeah. Two quick ones. I mean, we we didn't touch on. There has been a whole bunch of policy announcements from the party over the past couple of weeks. We'll get to them on the show and, and sort of go through them in finer detail for all our shitting on the Labor Party in this episode and talking of the impending climate crisis. Yeah. There are good news stories about the stuff that the Greens are coming up with, and they're actually announcing policies well before an election, so you can get those ideas out there and discuss them. They're they're pretty wild Ooh. in that way, but. Uh, if you want to have a dig around and, and hear Bold. about that stuff, it's it's yeah, it's crazy. That's worth your time. I hope they're not afraid that that someone will attack them. They, uh, that's true, actually. I don't know. We should talk to Adam because someone might start a scare campaign about them. Yeah, I'll get in touch with him. Um, another thing you do is switch your power provider to Cooperative Power. People might have seen the story this week that Power Shop has been bought out by Shell, which is bad. Power Shop was bad. a yeah. supposed to be a community owned green power supplier um, that was sort of backed by GetUp that was working closely with them. Shell, um, not the most environmentally friendly organization in the world. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, Emerald, mm, but they, they yeah. have some issues. So people thought exactly. that's bad. Cooperative power is all community owned. It's not for profit. You can get green energy. All that money goes back into making more green power and also doing cool stuff like funding strike funds and stuff. So it's closely tied to the union movement and helping workers take direct action themselves. Um, it's a pretty... Good thing. And you can get cheaper power as well. So you can go to cooperativepower.org.au to find out more if you want to make the switch today. Hell yeah. They're not paying me or anything to, to say this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hashtag ad. Jeez. <laughs> Uh, but that is the show for this week. Thank you so much for listening. Serious Danger is produced by Michael Griffin and made possible with the help, the very kind help of the Green Institute. Keep those messages coming in. Rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. We're on all the places at Serious Danger AU on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Subscribe to us on YouTube, on the SoundCloud as well to help the SoundCloud go off. Please leave your comments. <laughs> <laughs> For all the info, go to SeriousDangerPod.com. Email us anytime at hello at SeriousDangerPod.com. Thank you, Emerald. And uh, I'm sorry that you have to leave the show. Please stop trying to kill yeah. our elected representatives. May you all be rising stars or moons. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Serious Danger Australia. Did you listen? Have you listened to, uh, to Castle? I can't remember. Yeah. Not my vibe, but... Yeah. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> Good for you. Very nice. Just, I just, I like musicals. You yell, yell <laughs> your little heart out, Emerald. <laughs> God bless. <laughs>